So this is actually a good question I got, which is when you're working with a device like a Kinect or Leap Motion or a Hokuyo that creates a big tracking space, how do you isolate a small section in the middle for your actual interactive content? And actually, this is a really good question because especially if you're using Kinect and Leap Motions, they're pretty flexible sensors. And I've seen people do everything from, you know, put a Kinect facing top down above a dance floor. You kind of isolate the stage where you want interactive stuff to happen or maybe you're using something like a leap motion below a computer monitor and you kind of want to keep the interaction inside the com computer monitor and scaled correctly. So this is actually a super common thing and it doesn't have to be too difficult to get up and running. So I'm going to go down to my screen here. And the first thing I like to do is just draw a quick little diagram to explain some of the concepts we're working with. So I'm going to make a little circle. We're going to pretend this is our sensor. And I'll make a rectangle that we're going to pre presume is our arbitrary sized tracking space. So we can say this maybe is a connect and this is kind of the tracking space. Maybe it's a leap pointed up underneath a computer monitor and this is the whole tracking space. And then the very common thing is that inside of that, you are going to have your actual region of interest. So maybe, you know, inside of the connect region, this is your stage, maybe inside of the leap motion kind of field of data. This is your computer monitor, whatever it is. It's the same concept that we're trying to get, use this small area within the bigger context of the tracking space. Now, it really doesn't take that much, you know, crazy math or crazy programming skills to do this because all we have to do is actually just measure within the larger units of the tracking space where the start and stop points of our kind of mini region of interest are. Then what we can do is we can take those, normalize those to zero and one, and then also clamp those values so that even if our user is kind of interacting over here, it's just going to be clamped over here. So with that said, let's actually dive into touch designer here. And what I'm going to use today is my mouse as the kind of fake sensor. So I'm going to make a mouse in chop. And the first thing I like to do with this, because like I said, you can make complicated versions <clears throat> of these systems. You can have all kinds of auto calibration, but when push comes to shove, just a real quick and dirty manual calibration process that only takes, you know, a few seconds really might just be the best bet. So what I usually do in this case is first of all, select out my two different channels here. So first I'll get TX. I'll copy and paste that and I'll grab the TY channel. Then I'm going to create a trail chop for each one. And this is going to allow me to monitor the movement of that sensor data, which in this case is my mouse over time. And what I'll do is I'll turn up the window length on both of them just a little bit longer, maybe 10 seconds. So now you can imagine that we have this full range of motion coming from our sensor. In this case, it looks like negative one to one on the X axis and looks like negative 0.5 up to 0.5 on the Y axis. And a really easy way to get those minimum and maximum values, not only if we're trying to measure the full range, but especially if let's say, for example, what I did was if this was my sensor, and in the middle of my screen was my tracking area, I could just kind of move my sensor data back and forth. And we can see here on the X, we get a pretty consistent data range that tells us, okay, well, if I analyze the maximum and minimum of this, I'll, ex I'll know where the boundaries of my region of interest are inside of the larger kind of sensor space. And this is really easy to do in touch designer because we have something called an analyze. And what we can do with an analyze chop is actually create two of them per trail. One of them is going to be getting our maximum value from within this whole long range of data that we're kind of trailing. And the other one is going to get our minimum. Now, just like that, by setting those two up, essentially what you could do, and we'll, we'll set them up for the Y coordinate as well. But now you can imagine that you could literally just run up to the screen move your hand back and forth in front of the screen 
like if I did this, and all of a sudden you'd have your boundary values within that, you know, arbitrary, you know, maybe for connect it's negative three to positive three, for leap maybe it's a negative one to one, for the mouse it's negative one to one, whatever it is, just by kind of moving your, you know, hand or object inside of that sensor space where you want to find those values, you can quickly lock in quick min and max boundaries. So now what I can do is actually copy and paste that for my Y position. And now I have the X maximum, X minimum, Y maximum, Y minimum. So now what I could do that's interesting is since I already have the X and Y selected out here, I'm just gonna move this stuff up a little bit. I could create a math chop for each one of these. And inside of the math chop, I know that I want to get this range from my minimum to my maximum. And I want to rescale that to be zero and one. Now there's a lot of easy ways to do this, but we could even just drag and drop some parameters here. So I can go to my analyze maximum, activate the viewer, go to my math, go to the range. And then in the from range, I want to say this is the maximum and this one is the minimum. Now I'm going to do the same for my Y coordinate here. Now the cool thing about this system is that it's, it's still kind of in between manual and automatic calibration because there's the manual step of that you have to run in front of the sensor and kind of just walk back and forth in the boundaries or kind of move your finger in that region of interest to get those minimums and maximums. But then it's going to automatically write those values to the math chop, which is then going to scale that range from whatever value it is to now be zero to one, which is a very clean, normalized kind of value we can work with. So usually what I do in these kind of situations, because you know, believe it or not, sometimes you don't have the time to make crazy automatic calibration systems and you really just need to quickly run up to the screen, go move your hand from edge to edge and then know exactly where those boundaries are. So a lot of the time what we'll do is we'll make a system like this, have someone run over to the screen, go like this left to right, all the way across, go up and down, get those minimum and maximum values. And you can see my trail chops are building up their X and Y data. And then what we do is we just lock these trails. And now we kind of know exactly where our boundaries are inside the minimum and maximum for our TX and TY, which are now gonna get routed to our math chops. Now, the reason we lock these is because if you don't lock these, it's kind of perpetually trying to analyze this, which is not what we want, because we kind of just wanna test it once, get those boundaries, and then not have it change. Because unless your sensor position changes or the screen position changes, or the region of interest position changes, you do this once and, and you're basically set for a good long while. So now I've got this value, you can see it goes from zero to one inside of that range that I was kind of moving my mouse around in. But you'll also see if I just keep going out of that, I'm gonna get all kinds of crazy values like 1.7 on the X, you know, 1.25 on the Y or negative 0.7 on the Y. So then the next step that I usually go through is just clamping this. So we can use something as simple as a limit chop and I can say clamp inside of a minimum of zero to one. So now what you can already see, at least for my X, is I have a very clean zero to one value that starts and stops at the kind of arbitrary screen boundaries I drew with my mouse. And even if I go outside of that, it just stays at one. And if I go below that, it stays clamped at zero. So I'll copy and paste that so I can use it also for my Y position. And now you can see very easily, I have my zero to one for the Y and zero to one for the X. Then you can kind of merge these two back together. And you have a scaled, clamped, very clean sub region, you know, your kind of region of interest from a larger data field or sensor field, ready to use for any of the kind of interactive content you want to use. So I think this is a good trick to keep in every back pocket because sometimes we overanalyze this and we make these really complicated rigs of 
you know, trying to do matrix math or using like different kinds of sensor data to get some boundaries. And while those systems are nice, a lot of the time it really just comes down to quickly finding the boundaries of your region of interest inside of the sensor space, scaling those regions to zero and one, and then just clamping off the rest to ignore it. So hopefully that helps. Thanks folks. Hey folks, thanks for watching. If you're serious about learning touch designer and getting into our interactive and immersive industry, I highly recommend you check out the interactive and immersive HQ Pro. It's the only educational resource and community of its kind for touch designer and interactive professionals. You can click the link in the description to learn more about that. And if you like this video, hit that like button. And if you're new here, don't forget to hit subscribe and click on the little bell icon for more awesome free content.